I'm growing up in a world that says to be woman, to be girl is to like pink, to like purses, to, to want to play with dolls. I didn't do any of that. So much of what I became and lived out was stuff that was spoken over me yeah. and confusion that I had ingested because no one had ever taught me um, that you can be your own kind of woman. I've had so many conversations with people where they have told me, Jackie, I have tried to be straight. I've tried, I, I got married to a woman, I got married to a man, I, I did all this stuff and it never worked. And my question is, but did you ever try to love Jesus? That's different. <laughs> because if you are coming to Jesus to be straight, then you are not coming to Jesus for Jesus. Therefore, you have only in inherited another idol. When I first started to notice uh, same-sex desires, it was me comparing how uh, other girls felt about little boys to how I was feeling, which was, oh, I like and want to get to know this little girl in the same way that these, you know, the other kids on the playground want to know the little boys and all the things. And I didn't know where it was coming from or why I was experiencing it. And I think if this was in early 90s, like if this was 2020, then I probably would have had a word to define myself by way earlier. <laughs> but it. I didn't. And so it was just within me. And so I went to church. I used to go to church with my Aunt Merle every Sunday. And uh, at some point I heard them preach or teach about homosexuality. And that was when I, like, I heard the behavior, then I heard the title and it's like, oh, this is what I'm experiencing. And, but I, I distinctively remember that the way they talked about it and the way they discussed it, it, it discussed the topic, it, it felt shameful mm -hmm. to be someone that would embrace it or experience it. And so I just kind of kept it to myself because it was like, this is clearly not something that Christians like. <laughs> this is not people that Christians esteem. Uh, and so let me just, you know, deal with these issues within myself until it got to a point where I couldn't keep it quiet anymore. There was no outlet mm -mm. Uh, in the 90s, okay? Well, you start winding back to the 80s and the 70s and 60s, it only gets worse. Yeah. You go back too far, there's laws and penalties, and you go back to the Old Testament, it's a death sentence. Right. Okay? So maybe um, what we need to do is, is realize that, you know, we've been saying it back in the back, we're, 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 talking about your book, mm -hmm. Gay Girl, Good God, but we're not, well, you could replace the gay word with pretty much anything. What about gossip? Mm. You know, it, see, sexuality doesn't send you to hell. Not knowing Jesus sends you to hell. Mm -hmm. So we've gotta, we gotta talk about this. Yeah. And you know, you, you explain things in a way uh, that is testimonial in nature. This is what God did for you. So just walk us through, keep going. Let's get through this. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, when I was in high school is when it became harder to behave as a heterosexual where I had all these desires and all these feelings. And even in my friendships, I wanted it to be more than a friend, but I was so afraid of not only doing it, but admitting it to myself, Wow! <laughs> you know, because I didn't know what that meant. In the, the context I grew up in, it's like, this will send me to hell. Um, not even realizing that I already had a hell problem. Yeah. Th that I was, I was already a sinner. I, was, I wasn't even living righteous in the first place. Um, and so I just decided, I said, you know what? I'm gonna just try it. I'm gonna just do what, you know, I do. And so I got on MySpace, <laughs> which was, ar is archaic now. <laughs> and um, I connected with a young lady. We ended up being in a relationship for around two years. In that time is what I transitioned into what in the black lesbian community is called a stud. And so a stud is the woman who kind of projects a kind of hyper-masculine self. And so I sag my pants, I would wear certain bras to flatten my chest, I put my hair in a ponytail, my voice is already heavy, didn't have to change that much. Um, and so there's also not only a sexuality 
uh, experience I'm having, but also a level of gender confusion. Um, and I think a lot of that was exacerbated by the culture because uh, I'm, I'm growing up in a world that says to be woman, to be girl is to like pink, to like purses, to want to wanna play with dolls. I didn't do any of that. And then what they call me, they call me tomboy. They are labeling me a different gender just on the basis of me not doing these socially constructed uh, definitions of womanhood and manhood. And I think we do the same thing to little boys. We say, oh, he's crying like a girl. Wow. Instead of seeing his emotion as an expression of him being an image bearer, mm -hmm. right? And so I think so much of what I became and lived out was stuff that was spoken over me yeah. and confusion that I had ingested because no one had ever taught me um, that you can be your own kind of woman. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a wrestle. But at the same time, I enjoyed myself, uh, which I think people got to be honest, is that sin to a certain degree is enjoyable. It's not lasting. It's not eternal. But I was having fun, <laughs> you know. It was, it was I, I felt at home with the women that I was with. I felt safe, I felt loved, I felt taken care of. And so that makes it even harder when you hear the call to repentance and for someone to say, well, this is unnatural, but it feels natural to me, mm -hmm. you know? And so that sounds foreign and it sounds like a lie for you to say, I have to stop doing what's making me happy. It sounds foolish, which is what the gospel says, or what the scripture says the gospel is. Okay, help us understand something. We, you know, we have this idea that sin sends you to hell. The church projects that. I don't know how that is, but okay. But the problem is you're born in sin. Short of understanding who Jesus is, who he was, what he did, died, resurrected, and ascended to the Father, and your belief in this, that is what transforms you. So why is there this singling out, let's say, of sexuality sin? Why are we singling it out? And why is the church projecting that a particular sin sends you to hell when not knowing Jesus sends you to hell? It's a big question. Uh, well, the wages of sin is death. And so sin does incur judgment from God. I think a part of the problem is that the way we read the scriptures is that we sometimes accuse people who are experiencing temptation of being actively sinful. So what I mean is that in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, it says, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God. Notice how often we leave out practice. Oh, hey. We say homosexuals, which implies just your experience of the temptation warrants you hell. When it's like, but Jesus was tempted in every respect yet without sin. And so it is possible that someone can experience temptation and yet at the same time, that doesn't necessarily mean that that temptation warrants them hell. If anything, the temptation is a signpost that their nature, that there's a sinful nature, a flesh at work that needs to be renewed and needs to be put to death. Um, and so I just, I think it's, I think it's bad Bible reading. Yeah. But I think also the, um, kind of talking about sexuality all the time. We talked about this earlier, which is, I think it's, it's, it's so, it's easy to bully minority groups, okay? And so sexuality or those who experience gay sexuality have always been the minority group on the playground. And so they are the ones that are bullied. They are the ones that are talked about most. They are the ones that are spoken against most because if we speak against uh, heterosexual perverted ways of expressing sexuality. Now we're indicting the pastor and the deacons yeah. and the people in the church. So we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about we want to talk about the groups that are experiencing sexuality and expressing themselves in ways that we don't because that is a kind of self-righteousness. But also at the same time we have to acknowledge the fact that the church is often 
in our discipleship and evangelistic efforts, we are often responding to what the culture talks about most. And so if the culture is talking about gay identity and trans rights and all these things a lot, then the church naturally will discuss it a lot. And so I think it's a really complicated situation that we're in anytime we venture into a conversation about sex. Okay, so take a minute and talk about this issue in a way that let's just say the church was uncomfortable talking about or they shouldn't have been, but they were. What do we need to say on this program that hasn't been said? And I circle back to even something you said earlier. You said there wasn't a word that I could even describe myself. If I was five or six or seven years old in 2020, 2021, 2022, there might be a word that I might have been able to label myself with, but you didn't even have a word in 1990, yeah. you know, to, to label yourself. What, what do we as believers in Jesus and, the, and what that is need to say that hasn't been said? How do we help this situation? I think what we need to do is read the scriptures, two, listen to people, three, pray for wisdom. Um, it is so much easier to go out and try to figure this thing out by yourself, but we legitimately need the spirit of the living God. And also know that this isn't strange. Uh, what's happening in Genesis 3, Eve is in the garden minding her sanctified business. And the serpent steps up and says, hey, did God really say you shall not eat from the fruit of the tree? And she looks at the thing after conversing with, with the devil and she says, oh, that looks good for food. Oh, that's a delight to the, to the uh, eye. Oh, that's desire to make one wise. She has an affection for a created thing. She has a temptation to, 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 to take a part or uh, to engage with something that God told her not to. Mm -hmm. And so what is happening in the culture is what has always been happening, is that we have passions at war within us that are waging war against our souls. And so I think having that framework to know this isn't a random thing, nor is it something that you're also divorced from. Yeah. You have passions passions too, gay or straight. How many people do we know that are yet and still married and still tempted to be with someone that they're not married to? That is a passion that God calls us to put to death. And so, I don't know, man. We just, we need help. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And it's all done by the Holy Spirit. For sure. That's the only way we can do it. <laughs> Because, you know, I, I think your part in labeling sin, you know, well, we have sweet Christians that are, are addicted to pornography. And or we have angry. sweet Christians that have road rage. Yeah. And we have sweet Christians. That are gossips. That are some of the worst yep. talkers that, that there can be. So I know, I know so much of that. I mean, so we were looking at Proverbs 6. Um, these six things the Lord hates. It's a strong word. <laughs> yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. That's now, I of am us. guilty of maybe a few of those. Yeah. Well, I think that this little list of things here, I'm just, I'm just curious as to why we elevate sexual sin over other sins and we, it's a confusing issue to me, yeah. for reals. Yeah, we're self-righteous and othering people makes us feel better about ourselves. There's an identity issue at play. And there's also a lack of compassion. It shouldn't excite you to condemn people. Yeah. It shouldn't give you joy yeah. 
to have to tell someone that they may not inherit the kingdom of God. And so that tells me that there's a lack of grief and mercy mm. at work in you, in that you are so prone to identify all of these bad people and never once say, woe is me. Yeah. You know, and so I, I, th I think we have a problem, but I, I also have to remind those who I've conversed with within the LBGTQ community is that some of the experience that, experiences that you have had with so-called Christians are actually not with real Christians. Because mm -hmm. what is fruit of the Spirit? Right. Love, kindness, gentleness for one. Mm -hmm. And so if that is lacking consistently, <laughs> and persistently, mm -hmm. then I have the right to question if you actually know God. Why? Because mm -hmm. God is mm -hmm. love. And so I've had to do the work of letting people within the gay community know, hey, some of the people you met mm -hmm. don't actually know God, yeah. and I'm sorry. Yeah. But even in that work, I still have to define what is love then. What is kindness then? What is compassion then? Because if their definition of compassion and kindness and love comes from the world, then it doesn't come from the scriptures. Wow. And so I can't also submit to how you see kindness because then I'll be unfaithful, right? And so I, 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 that's why I say, I think it's a, it's a lesson in wisdom and prayer and redefining and clarifying that always has to be anchored in a love for the person rather than a boosting up of my own image. Yeah. Well, and, and, and taking up our cross. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a point where I just, I do it because the Bible says mm -hmm. to do it or not to do it. Yeah. Although your flesh is, you know, I'm, you know, and you, so what does that scripture mean to you? Yeah. Take up my cross. Taking up your cross. And Daily. You. Daily. One, it reminds me that crucifixion is constant. And that's a part of discipleship that is rarely communicated because we tell people come to Jesus, but we don't tell them that they have to die all the time. You know, like come to Jesus and you're going to get eternal life and it's going to be all good. It's like, yeah, but hard is the way. <laughs> and few will find it. That this walk, this, this walk comes with much suffering and a bunch of that suffering is attached to me having to die to what feels so true and so real mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. Uh, but it also means that crucifixion hurts. Yeah. And it also means that crucifixion takes time. Crucifixions historically were very long deaths. Mm -hmm. So it means that there are temptations and passions within me that I will have to put to death for a long time and may or may not be able to defeat them finally, but one day I will in glory. Right. And so I, I think that's what I see is that God has called me to be like himself, which is what our culture does not want to do. Mm -hmm. It does not enjoy dying to themselves because they think that in, in loving themselves that they will find life. Mm -hmm. But there's only life in Jesus. Mm -hmm. God has every intention to change who we are. Yeah. We are by nature children of wrath. We are uh, born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And God has every intention to create us again, to make us new creatures, to give us the right to become children of God. And so the Bible is all about change, all about conversion. It's just the way we've communicated as Christians has been unbiblical. For example, we've told people, hey, if you come to Jesus, what change looks like for you is that he'll make you straight. Mm. As if heterosexuality is a fruit of the spirit. But I've never seen that in Galatians 5. I don't see that nowhere in Romans 6. <laughs> what, what I see, even in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, which I quoted earlier, we leave out verse 11. So again, uh, don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor swindlers, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God, verse 11. But such were some of you. But he does not say, and you were made straight. He says you were sanctified, mm -hmm. you were justified, and you're glorified. Uh, 
I'm missing one, <laughs> by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. And so what Paul speaks to, what conversion, what true change is, is that God has saved me and set, apart, uh, set me apart for himself. He has made me right, justified me with God. And so these are the things that we need to be communicating as change, which is that God makes us new people. And even in us being new people, we still have the same body. Therefore, we have the same struggles, the same temptations. But now we have a spirit that fills us with power that is able to help us to defeat and fight those things that we are tempted to leave God for. I imagine that if that is the way that we communicated change, we would actually have more conversions yeah. because now we've preached a real gospel mm -hmm. and not a prosperity gospel because it is a kind of prosperity gospel to say, hey, come to Jesus and he'll make you straight, implying you can come to Jesus and be temptationless. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus didn't have that kind of life. Right. <laughs> so we want to tell people what it really means to be a Christian, which is you're going to struggle, but you're not going to struggle forever. And you're going to pick up your cross and follow me. For sure. And so there's this weird kind of discussion that doesn't get <laughs> talked about very much, that if somebody is struggling with sin, then they're identified as that. Mm. Well, who isn't struggling with being angry or this or, you know, or, you know, I mean, my dad told the story of his own father who left the foal and got on a horse and wanted to become a professional gambler. <laughs> okay. This is when, before automobiles and the whole time. And he was in, I guess, a saloon and, and was playing cards and the, the, okay, he was involved in alcoholism. He was involved in wanting to run away. And when he finally surrendered at the, at the knee of his grandmother, mm -hmm. okay, my dad's dad, and, and she prayed and, and he actually received Jesus, quote, he didn't want to drink again. He didn't want, and it was called into the ministry and all this. Yeah. So sometimes we get this conversion experience confused uh, and we say to somebody, the moment you surrender to Jesus, you're just not going to be tempted anymore. Mm. And what's your problem? Mm. Yeah. And, and if you're having a problem converting from gay to straight, for example, then that's on you. Yeah. Because, because we've made heterosexuality the, equivalent of, the, spirit. the equivalent of holiness. Mm -hmm. And it's not the same because we are all sexual. First of all, heterosexuality and homosexuality are even categories that have not existed prior to 1800. And so we're already dealing with contemporary ways of seeing our sexuality, okay? Um, but I think beyond that, it's that we are all sexual beings, but we are also sinful. Therefore, we are all sexually broken. And so it is unhelpful for me to assume that for you to become straight is equivalent to you being holy. It's not. So what we need to say is, no, you need to come to Jesus. You need to love Jesus and serve Jesus. I've had so many conversations with people where they have told me, Jackie, I have tried to be straight. I've tried, I, I got married to a woman. I got married to a man. I, I did all this stuff and it never worked. And my question is, but did you ever try to love Jesus? Mm -hmm. That's different. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> because if you are coming to Jesus to be straight, then you are not coming to Jesus for Jesus. Therefore, you have only in inherited another idol. And that's not what we want. We want legitimate, legitimate conversion, legitimate conversion where the spirit of God and Jesus's righteousness is imputed to you. And now you love him more than anything, even when you struggle with everything. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth of the matter. But we have hope to him who is able to keep us from stumbling, to present us faultless Come and blameless on. for his glorious presence with great joy. It's like we, this tension between our bodies and our hearts and our passions and our minds will not always exist you know, but if we are a slave to that now and refuse to repent, we will be a slave to it forever. Oh I, I love you. I love when you get going like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Well, and we, so, so the power of the cross and what Jesus did for us at the cross takes away all the excuses. It does. 
because he, he, he really has made he really has made a way. And um, it's so offensive. It's so offensive to say um, that who or what you believe is so true of yourself is wrong. And I, I do understand that. I, I understand it. But where are we getting even that framework? Is it from God? Is it from the apostles? Is it from the prophets? If anything, what, what the scriptures are saying is we live in a place where everything, everybody does what is right in their own eyes mm -hmm. and that our hearts are deceitful above all things. Who can possibly know it? And so we need a transcendent wisdom that is not dependent on what the culture believes is right, but what, what has been revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ and is that he is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. And he has risen from the dead so he could give life to our mortal bodies and give us the power to raise above all the things that are relegating us to death. And so it is an offensive gospel, but it is the power of God unto salvation for those who by the power of the spirit choose to believe it. And so we have no choice but to preach this thing that makes some people mad and makes other people saints. <laughs> that's our predicament. So the idea that we make an idol of either homosexuality or heterosexuality mm -hmm. is just, a, it's just trading one idol for another. Yeah, neither will save you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So the idea that, that Jesus is the only true goal here, yeah. and if, if and the holiness of 2007 God. Jackie Hill Perry didn't understand. Jackie Hill. <laughs> yeah, it was Jackie Hill. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Jackie Hill. 2007 Jackie Hill uh, didn't understand that basically what you were going to get when you got Jesus. Mm. Yeah. So, so what changed? How did, how did you become who you are today? Mm -hmm. And what was the, what was the impetus mm -hmm. for you understanding the purity and the love of Jesus that would never let you down? How did that finally come about? Well, one, um, it sounds silly, but I really do think Sunday school was, is partially to blame mm. because they taught me really basic truths about Jesus. Mm. They had me, you know, colored a little paper with Jesus and the little lambs, and they told us John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. And it's those really simple but fundamental gospel truths that actually did something to my conscience during the whole thing. It, it, it's, it's, it's really hard to continue to sin when you know the truth. And so it got to a point where I was just convicted all the time and it was getting on my nerves. You hear me, Lord? It was yeah. getting on my nerves. <laughs> I was always reminded that God wanted me, mm -hmm. that God died for me, that God was displeased with my sin. And I called my cousin Keisha because she was the only Christian that I had a relationship with that would actually have a conversation. Like I knew if I called her, we wouldn't go uh, like to Leviticus 18 immediately in oh. Romans 1. Like she would actually ask me about my dad. And so <laughs> I called her, uh, which is a word that you want to be the kind of Christian uh, that treats people like image bearers and not people to be fixed. And I sensed that from her. So I called her, I said, hey, I feel like God is calling me, uh, but I don't want him. Like, I'm really enjoying my life. I don't, I don't want to be a Christian. And she said something that made no sense to me at the time. She said, uh, God is going to show you how much you need him. I was like, okay, whatever. So I got off the phone. And my life started to get a little difficult, which I think was God's providence allowing suffering to force my, my head to look up and say, oh man, life isn't as good and as easy and as lovely as I want it to be. And so I would do what I usually did, was to smoke a bunch of weed to get some sort of peace until, eight, <laughs> <laughs> until October 2008. I'm 19, I'm in my room, minding my business, not doing nothing spiritual because I didn't go to church. Christians always looked at me weird and so I didn't like to go into their world. And so God brought him, his spirit into 
to mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in my room and I heard a thought and it was, she will be the death of you. And it was weird because I was like, wait, like, first of all, I wouldn't say that to myself. Don't think the devil would. So maybe it's the Lord. And so I started to have this conversation with God and my immediate response to God was, but I don't want to be straight. Because again, the gospel message I had heard is that to be Christian is to be straight. Not to be, is to, not to be Christian is to be holy. And so I just was like, God, I, but I don't want to be straight though. And I felt God speak to my heart and say, just learn to love me and we'll work everything else, else out. And so I started to think about my life and everything that I loved and enjoyed. I thought about my marijuana addiction, my theft, my uh, disrespect of authority figures in all forms, my idolatry, my uh, just every, every single thing that I loved and enjoyed had nothing to do with the glory of God. And at that moment, I realized that my only, like my primary issue was not my sexuality, but my unbelief. It was that I lived my life for myself. I did whatever I wanted to do, whenever I wanted to do it, which is utterly rebellious against the living God. But at the same time, I remember John 3, 16, which said, oh, so when you said, for God so loved the world that whoever believed, you were talking about me too, <laughs> that, that I'm the person that if I believe that I'll have eternal life. And so that's really what happened is that I realized, okay, if God is presenting himself as an alternative to everything that I love and enjoy, he must be better than everything that I've loved and enjoyed thus far. <laughs> and so in my repentance, it wasn't me, oh, let me be a good person or let me escape hell, is that I literally found through the power of the Holy Spirit, the fountain of living waters. Mm -hmm. That I, it was just, it was second Corinthians that the veil was being lifted from my eyes for me to see the glory that is in the face of Jesus Christ. And I did not know that was repentance. I did not know that was faith, but I do know that I was different immediately. Wow. <laughs> so that's what happened is that the Lord saved me, child. Yeah. That, that wasn't, that wasn't none of my works lest I boast. Wow. Truly.